What's the word, y'all? Ladies and gentlemen, we are getting more basketball, and that's all I really want in this world. If you did not know, if the Suns would have won today or the Heat would have won today, they had a real possibility of closing out this series on Sunday. It feels like the second round just started, and I was not here for no sweeps. So at the bare minimum, we're going to five. And no, I'm not saying I was rooting against the Suns because Chris Paul is my favorite of all time, and I want to see him get a ring one day. No, I wasn't rooting against Miami because I got a, a, a love for Jimmy Butler for what he did for Chicago, and Duncan Robinson is the homie, even though he don't play. I wasn't rooting against these teams, but I was rooting for more basketball. And at the bare minimum, we're getting five. And I'm excited about that, man. I did not want any sweeps. I want as much basketball, as much competitive basketball as we could get. And, well, we're getting at least five, and I'm excited about that. Let's start off where things started off with the 76ers winning against the Miami Heat. There's an old saying that that reigns true. I think even James Harden said this after game two, that a series does not start until a role team wins. And basically, um. Not, neither of these two series have started if that's the case. The Suns took care of business on their home court. They might, then uh, the Mavericks did the exact same thing. Miami took care of business, and now the 76ers did. So, I mean, it's still up in the air. I'm just happy that we're not getting no sweep. So, yesterday there was a tweet from Woe, from Shams. There's there's no way that Joel B plays. Okay, I'm exaggerating. But they did say that Joel B was listed as out. And I was listening to a podcast. I don't remember exactly which one because I subscribe to so many uh, sports but more specifically, NBA podcast, and they were saying it took Joel Embiid four days after he got hit by Pascal Siakam for him to even look at his phone. If you didn't know, he had an orbital fracture and he had a mild concussion. And though I've never had a concussion, to my not knowledge, you know, no, no, okay, let's just go with no because I've never been diagnosed. So I don't want to be self-diagnosed. I did take a big hit in football back in the day, and it made me never want to put on pads again because um um I had blurred vision for some time. Um, but Joel B couldn't look at his phone because the light from his phone was hurting his concu- hurting his brain. It was hurting his brain. So the fact that bro went from out yesterday to playing today is amazing. And you know what? It didn't give the Miami Heat much time to prepare because they thought that they was about to do the same thing they did in game one and game two. And in game one and game two, I was yawn fest for the first two games because it didn't feel like a playoff series. I think it was my guy Jay Skeets that tweeted this and he got some heat. And I don't mean that in the sense that the Miami Heat fans didn't make it feel. It just there was no reason to go ballistic because the Heat were taking care of business. Um, and, and today... Even though Joel Embiid only finished with 18 points and 11 uh, rebounds, and this wasn't an MVP performance like you expected from him, his presence was all you really needed. I'm going to show you a possession from game two, and you're going to see how much just Joel Embiid existence on the court matters. This is game two, um, and this type of defense worked wonders on the 76ers in game one and game two. B-Ball Paul going to come up, freeze frame. That's three bodies on James Harden. Because if you're the Miami Heat, George Niang just went 1 for or 0 for 7 in game 1. We'll live with it, whatever shot he get. Uh, is that four con Korkmaz? He basically was the least valuable player in all of NBA la- of this season. And Tobias Harris has been good, but he's definitely more of a rhythm shooter. So we're, we're okay with sending three bodies to James. Because even if we don't believe James is still the MVP player that he was two, three years ago, we still know that he can do his thing. So three bodies on him. And James made the right play. He found an open um, Niang, and it went exactly as you expect. You know, that's the type of defense that they were running at James Harden for two straight games. And today, I don't have the stats to prove this, but it felt like James Harden had way more opportunities to do one-on-one basketball and not one-on-three. If you did not watch this game and you were a stat sheet watcher, you would have saw James Harden in with 17 points, 4 from 11 from the field, um, one for seven for three, seven turnovers, six assists. You'd be like, man, James Harden hit a whack game. He did it. Now, <laughs> like I said, I, I do believe, I said this a couple videos ago, I do believe that James Harden that averaged 30 plus points per game is gone. He does not have that quick first step that he used to. Hell, he not even shooting the ball nearly as efficient as he did in those years either. Um, But I'm, I'm trying to figure out how do I change my expectations on an all-time great? Because it eventually has to happen, right? We did the same thing for Carmelo Anthony. Now, I'm not saying that what James Harden's doing it right now in 32 is the same as what um, Carmelo Anthony is doing right now in like 36. I'm not saying that. But we eventually had to subvert the expectations expectations that we have from Carmelo Anthony from a this is an all NBA player to okay good role player or okay above average starter or whatever and now I'm trying to I'm trying to subvert my expectations from the 35 point per game guy that we got three four seasons ago and I don't know what that is just yet but if you were just watching the box score it wouldn't tell you that James Harden was good today I, I know 36 percent from the field with seven turnovers Kenny that was good it was good today if you were watching this game because the game opened up so much more for him in the first quarter he was aggressive he was aggressive 
was getting to the basket, and, and like I said, he was 4 for 11, so he wasn't hitting, but he was getting to a basket, and one thing you could say, even though he ended, again, with seven turnovers, his playmaking is still at an elite level, and he gets a ton of hockey assists in this game, so I, again, it wasn't the all-NBA performance that were used for James Harden, but it was enough for them to take care of business. And right now, that's all I need from James Harden if they want to win this series. I guess. Maybe not. I mean, grand scheme, you probably need him to, to at least have one 30-point game, maybe? I saw a stat that James Harden hasn't attempted 20 shots in the game since he got traded to Philly, which again is something and I know we already had the conversation about the max contract or whatever he should be getting paid um and I just feel like that's going to be the conversation revolving around Philly and James Harden until whatever deal is being made if he takes his player option or they give him x amount of money or whatever the hell happens that's going to be the conversation revolving around it. I'm done having that conversation I'm just going to look at it at face value right now and say that James Harden today had an impactful game. The The big impact, though, came in that fourth quarter. Tyrese Maxey went into the end of the third quarter, basically, with zero points, and he ended with 21. Maybe not zero points, zero field goals made. He ended with 21. He, he only needed to see that first one fall, and after that, it was wraps. Bro saved the ball over his head, and it ended in a basket. He hit in his threes. He shot out of a can and every, every chance he get, and he was the X factor to close. Ah! Him and Danny Green were the X factors to close out this game and give them one on the board. Danny Green shot seven for nine from three. Now, I did not expect Danny Green to continue to shoot as bad as he had in the first two games because I know Danny Green. I know he could be a streaky shooter. And I remember back in 2013, I don't remember what year it was, with the Spurs where he damn near won finals MVP. I remember that, but they lost that series. I remember that. I know it was almost a decade ago, but I remember that. So I knew that he wasn't going to shoot as bad as he shot in game one and game two, and he didn't. He came out, hit seven threes matching his career high um and they needed pretty much i won't say every single one of those because once they went on that little run it was over with for miami but a big time win joel and b being there just opens up the game so much and it closes up the game for other people because in game number one and game number two bam out was one of the best players on the court and today he shot two for nine from the field and had five fouls he ended with nine total points i just my biggest gripe with with bam out has been the same for like two and a half seasons now i know all the talent that is in there bam out i know that he's one of the greatest defenders in the all nba because of his switchability they even talked about on the broadcast jay Jay Reddick was talking about um, how he switched amongst guards the most in, in the entire NBA. He didn't just say bigs. He said in the entire NBA. And he did a damn good job at it. Bam Adebayo goes through this periods of time where bro will not look at the rim whatsoever. And game one and game two was licking his fingers barbecue chicken because it was DeAndre uh, DeAndre Jordan and B-Ball Paul. And now I felt like because it was Joel Embiid, who's obviously a significantly better defender than those two dudes, he didn't even look at the basket. And when he did, it was like floater. It was, he wasn't as aggressive in this game. And I didn't need him to put up 20-something points like he did in game one and game two. But feel like a threat. Look like a threat. Today, nobody did that other than Jimmy Butler for the Miami Heat. Nobody. Only got, you know, Tyler Hero going to get double-digit points because he going to shoot double-digit shots. But everybody else, Kyle Lowry kept coming back from his hamstring, zero points, 0 for 4 from the field. Max Struess hit a couple early in the third quarter. But other than that, nothing. I already talked about Bam. P.J. Tucker's out there pushing people in the back and trying to be a nuisance. Pretty much everybody that played for them was a negative except for Jimmy. Jimmy tried to do everything he could, including trying to hit some threes, and he couldn't He couldn't do that. A lot of credit. To the, to the Philadelphia 76ers holding a team to 79 points in the playoffs is insane. The the Miami Heat played great defense too, preventing them from hitting triple digits. But still, Philly, shout out to you. I Let me know in the comment section because this is a real question. And and I think we all have to look, look ourselves in the mirror and try to figure out what the hell our expectations for James are for not just the rest of the series or the rest of the playoff run, but for the rest of his career. Is it is James like this because he's still recovering from his hamstring? Is this really the version we're going to get? Like, I, I don't really know. And, and when the 76ers make this trade, which was Ben Simmons, Seth Curry, DeAndre, uh, Andre Drummond, and I think two first-round picks, I think they were trading for an all-NBA player. And if this is the version that you're getting from James Harden for the rest of his career or however long he stays there, you didn't get what you were paying for. You know, I still believe that James can be an all-star caliber player. Hell, he was an all-star caliber this player uh, this year, and this is basically what we got from him, right? He is still an all-star caliber player at this rate, but you traded for him thinking it was going to be all-NBA. You traded for him thinking that the moments that you got in Brooklyn – was just because he was upset with the situation. Well, obviously, it wasn't that. You know, it wasn't just because he was upset with the situation. It was, maybe this is what we get. So, I, I'm very curious to see. I know I said I didn't want to talk about the offseason for the 76, but I'm very curious to see what Daryl Morey and them decide to do. Because, in my mind, I don't think you have an option other than either, hopefully, he takes his player option, right? You get one more year trying to figure out, hmm, what version of him are we going to get? Um, or you give him all the money that you 
you can because alternative to that is like we lose him completely and now we traded Ben Simmons two first round picks Steph Curry and Andre Drummond for nothing and I guess that if you do that you let him walk and you trade Toby you open up 50 million dollars of cap space but what does that tell to Joel Embiid I don't know I don't know I don't know you let me know what is your expectations for James Harden from here on out and what would you do if you were in the front office okay cool let's move on to game number two which was uh I had this theory and I had this theory and I guess it was mostly specific to baseball if you didn't know, I have a channel named Kenny Baseball. Go subscribe if you want to, if you're a baseball player or a baseball fan. And my theory in my one and a half years of being back into baseball. For, oh, also, baseball, Monday, um, I'm throwing out the first pitch for the Chicago White Sox. Crazy lifelong dream, I will say. And it's happening on Monday, and hopefully I get it over the plate. I had this theory, and it's based on no science whatsoever, because I guess I could go ahead and do some research. I don't have time for that. It was the birthday theory. That player A, X, on their birthday is going to perform better than normal. Um, Chris Paul proved that to be cap today because boy oh boy was he ass especially that first half he had seven turnovers he ended with seven so I guess the second half was better but I had, I had never this is the second time in my entire life of watching Chris Paul as a Chris Paul I'm not a stan because stan culture is weird and, and lame to me I'm not a stan I'm a big fan though because uh, stan means that I can't pull out faults or like what Chris Paul is doing that stupid you know thing that he did with Boogie trying to draw charges or him being overly aggressive and being dirty I, I don't look past those things stan's would um, I just love the way he plays on court. That's why I love Chris Paul. There's been two times in my my life of watching Chris Paul in playoffs why, where he played this bad in a single half. And the first one was last year's playoff, I guess, when he basically was playing on one arm and he would dribble the ball with the arm that was injured and he, he didn't have enough power in his arm for him to dribble and the ball come up. So he's bringing the ball up the court and it was slipping out of his hands. It was doing all that. And today, it wasn't the same because it wasn't necessarily slipping out of his hands, but it was just as bad. Today, it was Dallas's defense from the the first possession, the tip off. Reggie Bullock was all in Chris Paul's stuff. And, and my fiance sitting here and baby Avery sitting down here in her rocker. And I look at him like, you see Reggie Bullock? You see how he trying to guard Chris Paul? And I said to her, these are my exact words. He gonna still get, get, him, get him hell. He did not. Nope, that was Cap. He did not get him hell. Um, he played terribly. And that set the tone, the whole tone for the Dallas Mavericks' defense. It set the tone for, for everything. With Chris Paul going out there and he's trying to set charges or trying to do extra stuff and it's a charge on him. Or he's throwing into double coverage. It's just like very not Chris Paul-like. Because in baseball, Trey Turner hit for the cycle on his birthday. I feel like if it's somebody's birthday, bet the over on whatever. But not anymore. It's everybody except for Chris Paul, I guess. So the Dallas Mavericks defense was so good in your face, we gonna slap you first and, and we gonna make you pay. But deeper than that, um, I hope that these, these clips are up. Let me see if I can find a clip. I just want to show you how good of a de defender Reggie Bullock was today. They threw a lot of bodies at Chris Paul. Whenever he turned his back, a second defender was on the way. So they get right here. That looked like an easy pass, but no Reggie Bullock get his hands up at the perfect time to get to get a deflection, and that's a turnover. One of his other turnovers. Look look at Reggie Bullock's. Did I call him Reggie Jackson earlier? I don't matter. Another way where he just put his hands up, and with Chris Paul being small, that little wraparound pass don't work because Reggie Bullock is just taller than you. And then this one. This one's like just Reggie Bullock hounding him. Ruined his entire birthday. So that's not cool, Reggie. I, I I wouldn't recommend you doing that to somebody on their birthday, but he did. And, and something that's even deeper than that, deep, deeper than just the turnovers that they forced, they prevented Devin Booker and Chris Paul from getting to their spots. I feel like in game one and game two, especially when we got to that fourth quarter game two, I didn't even get a chance to uh, make a video about that. Um, when they were just hounding Luka, going after Luka, going after Luka, they were getting to their spots whenever they wanted. They did not, they cut off all avenues. And part of it was like, whoever was running the big, the big for the Dallas Mavericks, were playing significantly up and not allowing Chris Paul to get to that mid-range area. And and again, that's layman's terms because I'm not a coach or somebody that's super knowledgeable about defensive schemes and stuff, but that's the way it felt like. In game one and game two, it was like, I Isolation. Chris Paul's on the island by himself. Is him and Luca. But today it was like him, Luca, and now Maxi Kleber shading over. So that little mid-range jump shot that Chris Paul normally could get to anytime you want, he can't really get to. And Devin Booker and Chris Paul combined for a total of 22 shots today. Huh? Why did I feel like it was less than that? Still, the most amount of shots attempted in this game was Mikael Bridges, and the most points scored by the Phoenix Suns today was Jay Crowder. You're not gonna win many playoff games if Jay Crowder is your your highest scoring player. You know, so I got to give a lot of credit to the Dallas Mavericks, man. Luka was great. Jalen Brunson was great today. You know, when I listen to, like I said, I listen to a lot of podcasts and everybody, almost everybody that I listen to when they were recapping this or just talking about what they want to see. Um, I, I list, I try to listen to in market podcasts too, because I, of course I watch a lot of basketball, but I didn't watch all 82 games of the Dallas Mavericks in depth. So I go find a show 
that's hosted by some Dallas Mavericks super fans, and they tell you, boom, boom, boom. And a lot of people say, hey, we need Jalen Brunson to take some pressure off of Luka early because it seems like a game one and game two, once we got to that fourth quarter, Luka got kind of burned out. And in today's game, Jalen Brunson did exactly that. That length that had caused him problem in game one and game two didn't really matter, and he was huge. Maxi Kleeper, huge today. Um, Reggie Bullock ended up hitting four threes and playing elite level defense. Doran Finney-Smith also hit four threes. This was damn near the perfect game for the Dallas Mavericks. Now, that sentence could maybe scare you a little bit if you're a Dallas Mavericks fan. Um, I don't know how many times Jay Crowder is going to be the leading scorer for the Phoenix Suns, but I will say this is important. And you need to. You need to win game number game number four and protect your home court to keep this series alive, in my personal opinion. That goes for the um, the 76ers as well. You know, you, you got to make sure that that opposing team don't take one on the road. So a lot of love. One thing that I didn't expect is, like, Frank Nielakina getting some early PT in this one. No, he didn't do nothing. But I like to see that these coaches are trying to see what they see what they did incorrectly in game one and game two. And in game number three, we're going to correct those things and just try something new, throw them different looks. And I'm excited to see what Ime Udoka decides to do in game number four to change up some of the things. I'm excited to see what Eric Spolstra does to try to shrink the court, I guess, so that um, it's not too many opportunities for the 76ers. And, you know, it's, it's all chess. It's all chess. I love to see those things. So let me know what you think about these series. You know, what are the chances that the Mavericks win it? What are the chances that the 76ers come back? Let me know.